Good morning on this cool day. Finally, huh? My name is Sue Ann Palmore. My husband Bob and I have been blessed to be part of this church and serve the Lord for the past maybe decade. It's, it's been a true blessing. Today we're going to read again from Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, the whole armor of God, which is the foundation of our entire study. But I better put on my glasses. I don't have it memorized yet. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all the perseverance making supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. Thank you for reading. Good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be with you and a, a real honor to be in this church. Um, I got up pretty early. Was a was not a was a worshiper at the eight o'clock service and wow, it's a great thing to be here. I, we're honored to be here. It's uh, when I got the invitation, I just couldn't believe that I was going to be asked to come, and it's just really a, a pleasure. My wife Karen is with with me today, of course, and uh, we live in Galveston. I'm a retired Methodist preacher, uh, one of those old guys, <laughs> but. Uh, we live in Galveston. I'm, I work for the Endowment Fund of Moody Methodist Church and uh, really have a great time doing that. So I know a lot about this church. I've watched it for uh, years uh, and, and years, and uh, I've watched Jerry and his ministry. I've always been so impressed with how he has handled things and, and the progress and, and so forth. And it says a lot whenever he is away, and this morning sends a text to let me know that he's praying for me as we... Uh, as we in, enter into the uh, Sunday morning worship hour. It's really a tremendous thing. So I, I, I thank you, him for that. It's a wonderful time to, for Karen and I to be here with Chris, too, and Priscilla and Noel. You know, it's, it's also fun to be uh, to someone to say, oh, you, you must be Chris's dad. It's, it's wonderful to be introduced that way. To, so, oh, yes, I, as a matter of fact, uh, I am Chris's dad. That is Chris's mother, and, and we're proud of him, but it's really great to be in your presence today. So would you join me in prayer? Thank you, dearest God, for the way in which you care for us and the way in which you love us and show your love so in so many ways. And we're grateful that you are in our midst. Would you bless now these words? Let them be your words. Let you, the words you've given to me, would you change them as you see fit? And thank you for the opportunity to worship today. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. So occasionally I get to drive our 2004 F-150 pickup. Sometimes the battery is not so good like it is right now, but uh, I love to drive that pickup. 
It uh, actually belonged to Karen's dad and uh, passed down to us, and so uh, every now and then I get to drive it. It has this dent in the back of the tailgate. And the story goes that he was out in the pasture with the cows and the bull ran up behind it, just smacked it and put that dent in there. And that's not really the story, but it, uh, it's, it's better than the one that it probably is because that story is one that has been untold and there, it's, uh, that story is a mystery. And even I don't know how, that didn't get, how the dent got there, but I thought I should make that story up because it's just a lot better than probably what happened. Mr. Harrison uh, was a World War II uh, hero, fought in the Philippines and uh, in that whole region. His, um, his, his group fought for 306 days, uh, 306 combat days. I wanted to get that right. And I looked it up just to be sure because it's 219 continuous days of fighting. I just can't even imagine what that would be like. We had the privilege occasionally of going to his army reunions, and, uh, and one in particular, uh, the, uh, one of his friends was telling the story, and it was going way out there and on and on, and Mr. Harrison kind of leaned over to me and said, don't pay any attention to him, son. He is all hat and no cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and I've remembered that for quite some time. All hat and no cattle. I don't know if you saw it or not, but uh, I, uh, I have this uh, children's Bible. Uh, and for about the last eight or ten years or so, I've decided that I would use this particular Bible uh, to, uh, to preach from whenever I had the occasion. There's a couple of reasons for that. And it's this, if you don't mind me sharing with you. Because if I love God the way that a child loves God, then I would be a better man. I'd be a better husband. I'd be a better father. I'd be a better friend. I'd be a better grandfather. Shout out to Noel. <laughs> because when a child loves God, they love God with everything that they possibly have. It's just an amazing thing. You ask a child to help and you can hardly, hardly give them a, the job fast enough, at least most of the time, unless it's chores around the house. I do understand that. But you ask a child to help and the hands are going up. It's really the same with youth and students because, uh, you know, they, they want to make a difference. They want to make an impact. They want to make sure that things happen for good. They see something wrong, they want to right it. It's, it's just a, it just seems to be something that's so natural with children and youth. Occasionally, someone will say, you know, the youth, the children, the students, you know, they're the, they're the future of the church. <laughs> There's a better way to say that. Because certainly there's a future involved, but let's be truthful here. They're the church now, right now. They bring life and energy, and frankly, for us who are a little bit older, they increase our faith. They're the church now. We adults, we're the ones that slow things down. I have a pastor friend that said, you know, when I get to heaven, if I walk in and I see a bunch of folding chairs, I'm going out the side door. <laughs> I've had enough meetings. <laughs> because quite often, we adults, we're the ones with all talk and no action, or as my father-in-law said, all had no cattle. And I don't want that to be the way that I live my life, and I don't want that to be the way of the church, and I'm sure that you don't want it to be that way either. So today we're talking about a hat. <laughs> well, actually a helmet. You all know a good bit about helmets, don't you, around here in this football town. You know, when a player loses his helmet on the field, he has to come off for at least one play Every time I see that happen, I go, if it were me, I wouldn't be out for one play. I'd be done for the day. 
that's it. Probably done for the whole career, but then that's me. The helmet of salvation. It's meant to protect our minds from deception. It is meant to protect our minds from untruths. This helmet of salvation protects us from comments and teaching that makes us doubt who we are. And most importantly, doubt whose we are. Salvation is the promise that we always belong to God. We say yes to following Jesus and God seals the deal and forever we are his. Now to be sure about that, we rely on scripture a good bit, don't we? I know you do in this church. The, script, the love for scripture and is, uh, you know, it's just out there everywhere you turn. It should be. So when you think about how can I be sure that this, I always belong to God, we turn to that to scripture. And probably you could use eight or 10 or 12, but I want to share three with you all back to back. Here's how we know how we always belong to God. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, for surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call to me and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. So on some mornings, I'm able to go out on the back porch and sit and drink a cup of coffee, and we, we have, we're in love with our little puppy. She likes to sit on the front porch in front of me, and I'm behind her in the chair, just sit there for a few minutes. And I noticed one day a dragonfly just kind of buzzing around. I went, uh-oh, what's Lily going to do when the dragonfly? But I just watched, and she didn't see it for a while, and finally it came in her view and she stood up and looked at it in amazement. I thought, oh, she's going to want to make friends with that dragonfly. The dragonfly got the same level. She walked toward it a little bit. And then the, the dragonfly, who didn't want to make friends with the dog, of course, flies off. But in those few moments, I thought, I am watching something very special here. The innocence and just the nature. And I thought, God, are you? Are you in a dragonfly? Maybe. But what I really know when I encounter God is in sunsets, sunrise and sunsets. You should probably get them in order, right? Sunrise and sunset. Because when you see how it changes minute to minute and all of a sudden the different colors, oh God, you are so good. I, I didn't even know I was searching for you, but I searched and found you. You made yourself known to me and I wasn't even expecting it. Poof, there you are. And so I've told my family whenever I see sunrises and sunsets, I go, you know, I am so fortunate to be able to have the family that I have and the God that I have who claims me, accepts me always. Another scripture that's so important in this, uh, in this issue is the book of Romans, chapter 8. You probably know it well, but allow me to read a portion of it. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. For in all things, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God made known to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there a stronger, better promise in the scripture than that? 
I'm not sure there is. But there is one more that means a lot to me. And it came to me in really one of my very darkest uh, hours where I really was questioning all this stuff about the faith, all this issue about if God would take care of me and all these things. And I was in a bad spot and I had my Bible and I thought, I, God, you just got to just, you got to help me. I'm in a bad spot. Have you been in a bad spot before? It was one of those times I just kind of opened it and flipped around a little bit and there it was. The very end phrase of the gospel of Matthew, that great gospel. And it ends with that wonderful statement that says, remember, remember, I am with you always. And ever since that day, decades ago, the phrase always has just meant so very much to me. Now, you've been engaged in the book of Ephesians for several weeks now. And that small book in the New Testament is, was meant for not only the church in that particular area, but all churches had been established at that time. It was meant for everyone. And like the full body of Scripture, that is also meant for everyone today. Every church around. In fact, the book of Ephesians, it has this, you can sum it up by saying this is the gospel of truth, that salvation is by grace through faith, that salvation is that great work of God. It is not our work. It is God's work, God's work for us, delivering us from sin and death and opens the door to life eternal and now. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So when you have life, here's what you're able to do. This book of Ephesians, this verse in Ephesians just puts it out there for you. Because we have life, we can stand on truth. And because we have life in Christ, we can stand on God's righteousness. We can stand for the gospel of peace. And we can stand and rely on faith. And we can stand and we, we can rely on the salvation of God. This amazing gift of God's presence in our lives calls us, beckons us to put on the whole armor of God. So that when difficulty or temptation or tragedy or adversity or hurt or challenges come our way, and they do come our way, don't they? When they come, we're able to stand firm, stand firm in our faith. And I believe stand firm and tell our story. Because our story is one that's full of love and peace and grace because we have been able to overcome that which has come against us in life and be able to stand firm and tell the story of our witness to God. And our story is that we belong to God and there is nothing that can ever change that. When I was the pastor at First Methodist Conroe, we had a group of men that uh, met at about 8 o'clock in the morning, service at 8.30. They would solve all the problems of the world and inspect the preacher at 8.10. That's when I was expected to be there and talk about the sermon in three or four minutes. <laughs> and one Sunday, the gentleman said, I got a bone to pick with you. Oh, well, here we go again. What, what is it this time, John? <laughs> he said, I don't understand your sermon title. I went to myself, I don't even remember what the sermon title is. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with it? He goes, it says sermon, nothing. Ah, nothing. How can you have a sermon about nothing? I said, well, let me explain. We're going to use this passage in Romans where it states that Nothing 
can separate us from the love of God. And he goes, oh, gets his coffee, lifts it out toward me, <laughs> takes a sip of coffee. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> I passed the test. <laughs> Nothing can separate us from the love of God. This is an overwhelming, oh, what a song earlier. It is the overwhelming relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. Nothing can separate us from that love. So what is your story, church? What is your story here at Christ Methodist? Well, I can tell you that your story is strong. Your story is strong in mission and it is strong in ministry. I cheated just a little bit. I took a look at your website just because I, th I should make myself a little more familiar with it. Besides what Chris was telling me and what I knew from the past, what's, any, what's new that I might miss? Here, I found out a few things about you. I found out that you have an extremely strong ministry to children, youth, students, families, adults, the underserved, the challenged. I found out that you have a very strong witness and ministry, missions that are local, missions that are nearer, and missions that are further away. In the work that I do now, I'm familiar with some of the, of the, fray, of the missions that you, you sponsor. In, in particular, I'm familiar with uh, mobility worldwide. Uh, is anybody involved in that in the, in the, in the sanctuary today, in the service today? You've probably heard of it a little bit, is you, you make these carts, uh, this organization that makes the carts and they ship them overseas over into certain sections of Africa for people who are, have no use of their legs or do not have any legs at all. And this organization, which we help support too in the work that I do, enables people to move and be about, and some of them even are use it to uh, create jobs and it creates a way of life. In fact, I'll even tell you, it comes to my mind as one of my staff, when we were looking at this particular organization, we recognized we were able to put it in a category of life-saving. Life-saving work. Not just helping, life-saving. So that's something that you are involved in, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. But also, your witness includes things like Meals on Wheels and Family Promise and counseling and food banks, bringing what is needed to people who are struggling. And it's wonderful that you're also in work overseas in places like Spain and Uganda and Nepal and Ukraine. This helmet of salvation, this the promises of God enables you to stand and tell your story when there is a need that needs to be met. And something I know about this church is that whenever there is a need and it bubbles up and you go, oh, we need to do something about that, this church is not all hat and no cattle. This church is not just talk and no action. You seem to be able to figure out is that a need we should address? And if it is, let's get to it. You put on the helmet of salvation, not just to defend yourself, but also to witness to those around you who are facing some kind of difficulty or struggle or tragedy, something going on, and you are able to stand and tell your story of faith, love, and grace for what you have discovered, the salvation that's right there in front of us. And then I would ask you, what is your next story? What's next for you in your particular personal story as you remember to put the helmet of salvation on, enabling you to stand and withstand what comes against you and also to be able to witness and support what might be coming against somebody that you, that you know, your neighbor, your family, your colleague. What is, what's next for your particular story? Whatever it is, people of faith were able to stand, tell our story, and because we're, we want to serve this God of grace, 
We want to produce or at least try to produce fruit that would be pleasing in his sight. We want to follow his teach, attempt at least to follow all his teaching, attempt to respond when we feel God leading to us, and then because of the work you do collectively to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. What's next for your particular story? Whatever it is, you're going to stand firm and you're going to respond because that's the kind of people that God calls us to be. And I think that's your story, to stand firm and respond in faith. So, if you agree with me, it's always dangerous to say that, but if you agree with me, let the church say, amen. amen.